What's going on with Prairie View men's basketball? Texas Southern and Grambling women fight it out again, this time on NBA TV. And Alabama A&M has a new defensive coordinator. Oh, yeah. It's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU. Your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU Athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And me, of course, I am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me today, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day. For those who are watching on YouTube, you can see my Twitter right there. I will hold it up here for just a little bit. And you will also see me wearing a shirt of the greatest uh, cartoon of all time. But that's neither here nor there. But what is here and there is Prairie View's men's basketball team. What's going on with them? Because I'm used to the Prairie View that I'm used to. And I'm a Texas Southern alum, so I see them, right? The Prairie View that I'm used to is a team that is at the top of the swag. It's a team that is, if they're not in competition for that top spot, they're at least having talks around being one of those top elite teams. But this year, it's the just they're a middling team. And part of me keeps holding out and saying they can have it. They, they can have a, a spark. Something can happen. Anything can change. And I'm not going to lie. I'll believe that until the season is over. But it's going farther and farther. And it's, it's starting to make me not believe it because there here's the thing. This is why I feel like I can always count on them because they're led by coach Byron Smith. Great guy. I love coach Smith. I, and listen, I love coach Jones too. Coach Jones is my guy. You know what I'm saying? He, I, I, I got a real relationship with coach Jones uh, when I was out there. I, I love coach Jones. Coach Smith. That's my guy too. Um, I met him at my internship and I remember, look, I'll tell you how I met him because I didn't know he was the Prairie View head coach. At the time, I'm like, man, I'm not really paying attention to who their coach is. You know, I'm just, I'm Texas Southern fan mode, and I'm really starting to get into media at this time. I'm just now starting to get into sports media or student media. At first, I was just doing, like, YouTube clips about the Saints and things like that. But at this at this time, I'm starting to get into covering Texas Southern sports. I'm like, man, who is this old dude? We all in there. It's the intern. I'm like, man, who is this old dude cooking these young fellas? Because he was re- he was called a professor, so I didn't know who he was. And then I, I interviewed him um, for a, for I think, a post-game segment or something. And we finally talked. And he said he was the Prairie View head coach. I said, wow. Or maybe I heard about it. I don't know. But I was like, man, this old dude cooking people. And then the only other time I seen him after that was when I traveled to Prairie View for a TSU PV game. And nice guy. I talked to him because I was like, you know what, let me talk to him before the game. He might not want to talk after the game, after they get beat. And they did get beat. You know what I'm saying? T.S., 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 you, you, you. I thought you knew. But at the end of the day, he was a good guy. Great guy, you know, class act. Just had to. He's just on the wrong side. He's just on the wrong side. I would love him if he wasn't on that other side. But as a whole, he's not just a good guy. He's a great coach. He's been there for seven years. And over the last four years, they really started to hit their groove. And I think that it took him. This is his seventh year now. So it took him a couple of years to really establish himself. He was on the 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 um coaching staff before but it took him a little bit where he had to just get acclimated to being the head coach and i'm gonna go through some of these years real quick in 2018 they went 12 and 6 won a playoff game that's when it just clicked to him i guess winning a playoff game just took him over the edge in 2019 he went 17 and 1 in the regular season they were the regular season champs and they were the tournament champs then the next year in 2020 14 and 4 or 14 and 4 regular season champs that was the COVID year though so there was no tournament they won their first matchup but there was no tournament in that year and then last year he went 13 and 0 and that was a historic season undefeated in conference play they end up losing in the uh in the swag championship game to the illustrious texas southern but he they (laughs) all of that aside right i'm not throwing no more jabs at them now like this is just identifying it this guy's a great coach and has led prairie to a lot of success recently At the end of the day, all those jokes about TSU PV aside and just looking at it objectively, he's done a really good job with this Panthers men's basketball team. 
So when you see them struggling the way that they are, it's almost unbelievable. Like, I just feel like something's going to happen. They're going to right the ship. And if they were to get into the the play or into the tournament, as long as they don't fall too far and they still get into the tournament, I think they can beat anybody. But there's the problem. They're inconsistent. Because the team that takes Texas Southern to the limits, the team that beats Alcorn, should not lose to Mississippi Valley State. I know they were coming off of COVID, so there might be some extenuating circumstances there, just maybe even some lingering effects of just not playing. They hadn't played in a while because games have been canceled. But you also don't lose to Bethune-Cookman in the middle of the year. Like, you don't have those two highs and those two lows. That's not the team that you want to beat. So when I look at it, I say, man, they got to get something together as far as their consistency. In addition to fixing that inconsistency, there's two major problems with this team. One, they're careless. And then two, they just can't stop anybody. Their defense is really bad. And they're second to last in field goal percentage, three-point field goal percentage against them. Second to last in points scored. You look at them, they're bottom half in field goal percentages all around against them. They don't block any shots, so they don't really have any difference makers um, at the rim. They don't stop you there. But one thing they do really well is they, they steal the ball well. They're second in the SWAC in steals, but they're 10th in turnovers forced. So it's, 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 it's just weird because they don't add up to me. I don't feel like those numbers really add up to what you would think a team that gets a lot of steals would do. But that turnover conversation brings me to their offense. They're careless because they give up a lot of turnovers. So they're not getting any turnovers. They're not forcing many turnovers, but they're giving the ball up and they can't stop anybody. That's not a recipe for success. And do I think that Prairie View can write the ship? With Byron Smith as your coach and the success that he's had over the last four years and just building up that program, I will not say that they cannot be a playoff or tournament upset person, uh, player or upset team, excuse me. But it's going to be tough. It's going to be really difficult at the end of the day. Like, I, I, just, I just struggle to see it happening, but I won't rule it out because I do trust in Coach Smith. But I will say that it's, it's going to be tough. And going forward, I want to talk about the NBA TV spotlight, spotlight game, which is Texas Southern versus Grambling, and we're focusing on the women this time. BetOnline.net has you covered with everything that you need for the big game. It's only a couple of days away, and I am over the moon. I am ecstatic through the roof with anticipation, just waiting and just happy to see this game. It's the Rams versus the Bengals. We have player props on there. You can talk about who's going to have the most passing yards. You know, who's going to have the most receiving yards? Will there be a safety in this game? There's so many cool things you could talk about, and it's the biggest game of the year. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care. Game seven, NBA finals. I'm a football guy. I'll die on this hill. Super Bowl, biggest game of the year. Any sport, I don't, it does not matter. It does not matter. And you can wager on, on it. But if you say you're not a football person, that's just not what I do, Mouth of the South. Then you can go, you can do your NBA. No disrespect to the biggest game comment I just made. You can do NBA. You can do boxy, boxing, hockey, UFC. Your favorite Vegas casino games. It has everything there. That's why betonline.net is the best in the business. So go there, betonline.net, where the game starts. It's the fastest and easiest way to wage on all of your favorite sports. All right, as we keep on rocking on today's episode of Locked On HBCU, thank you for making us your first listen of the day every day. It's Super Week, and the big coverage for the big game comes from Locked On NFL, Locked On Rams, and Locked On Bengals coming to you live from Radio Row, so make sure you're checking out the experts in it. Don't, don't worry about them big wigs. Check out these guys, because they are the best in the business. I mean that. And today's word of the day is yin, meaning a strong desire, craving, or urge for something. So make sure we're going to use that in today's episode. And I want to talk about Grambling State versus Texas Southern. They are being showcased on NBA TV. And it's the, it's the second game that NBA TV is showcasing, but we're focusing on the women this side this time. Last week, we talked about FAMU versus TSU on the men's side. We're talking about the women this time, and we're going to look at what to expect by looking at what happened because this is the second time that they played this year. And they say if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it or something like that, right? Some type of cliche. I don't know. But overall, that's what you got to do. You got to revisit the past, see what's going on. And I'm going to look at Texas Southern first. In that game, 
they only had six players who played, and there was some extenuating circumstances. I think there was co- there was a COVID outbreak. Even Coach Cooper Dyke missed the game, if I'm not mistaken. But there was a COVID outbreak that led to a lot of players just not being able to play. They had enough to play, just wasn't a lot. They had seven players, and one only played a minute. So there was only six players that really played. They were able to score 73 points, and five of those players scored double digits. You're going to need everybody. If you have 73 points and you only have six players, everybody has to score. And that's what happened. It was evenly distributed. Even the player who didn't score in double digits was at eight. So they were only one game or one bucket away, really. Um, But that's what they they were able to do. And I felt like their best offense came when they were running the floor. And I think that might be one of the keys to victory and something to really watch for. I'm going to flash my Twitter right here because I am going to be tweeting about this game while it's going on at South Exclusive. So follow me for that. And I will be trying to tweet, give updates about what's going on. For those who aren't able to watch it, I will be checking it out. Um, I ain't going to be live tweeting. My fingers don't work that fast. And basketball moves way too fast to just be live tweeting for my thumbs. My, that's me personally. But I will give updates on what's going on. So make sure you guys are following that at South Exclusives. And um, running the court was something big. So I think that watching the flow and seeing if it's more of a half court game, seeing if Texas Southern is able to run again, I think that will be something that at least I will be paying attention to. And I'll probably try to make it a couple comments on it maybe one or two, not saying every tweet's going to be about the flow of the game, but they got 27 break uh, fast break points. And that's major. That's a major thing. And I think that's one of the keys to victory. It helped make up for a lot of other things that they were struggling at in that game. And they only had limited players. So for them to be able to score that many fast, fast break points with a couple of players playing 40 minutes, the whole game, a couple of players playing, I think over 35 for you still be able to, get that many fast breaks and still be able to run the 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 break or run the court with that much ferocity and that much skill and that much efficiency, I think is really, really impressive and something that they should try to do now, like in this game that's coming up on Saturday. So you and I will be checking out that. But overall, let's talk about it. What happened? They have five players in double digits, and one of those players was um, Andriana Avent. And I think that she's the one to be fearful of because – This ain't no disrespect. I'm going to talk about two other players after this. But she don't play a lot of minutes. She comes off the bench. Coach Coop likes to put her off the bench, and she comes in. She's the sixth woman. She's the sixth woman who played in that game. So when you look at it, I feel like she like that Drake line. She here for a good time, not a long time. And that's scary because she comes in and she just drops buckets. She don't play the most. I think she has like the third or fourth most minutes on the team, but she leads the team in points. So. She ain't coming in to give no assist. She ain't, she she can get some rebounds. She averages a decent amount of rebounds though. But she comes in with a yen to score. That's what that's what she's trying to do. And I think that's and she shoots really good from from three point shooting forty one percent. So if I'm grambling the defense, I'm looking. I'm saying you have a tendency or you're known to score in bunches really quick, and you shoot really well from three. I need to be watching out for you. And she's had a lot of games where she just put up points, but she's not the only one. She's not alone. You also have Ataya Bridges, and she scored 23, 19, 22, or 22, 19, 23. That, that was the order of her last three games, averaging 21 points a game over the last three games. And when I look at it, <laughs> she's playing some great ball. She's playing some great ball. So it's not just I need to watch for Advent. It's I need to watch for Bridges. And then Jada Perry is a player who – wasn't even able to play in that game. So that's a new dynamic that I'm interested to see. How does that, you know, just change how the game flows? Because she's a monster on the board, and she has three double-doubles in the last five games. So you want to talk about playing your best ball at the right time. It's not just Bridges. It's also Perry. And then Avent, she just a walking bucket at any time. You can't count her out. So I, I'm sitting there, I'm like, that offensive firepower, it's something. But if I'm grambling, I'm saying I have to stop the ball. I need to make this a half-court game. Yes, they put up a lot of multiple scores, or I mean double-digit scores, but I have to focus on my defense. And if I'm them, I forced a lot of turnovers. They had 27 turnovers on the day. Or they, yeah, they had 27 turnovers. Texas Southern did. I'm trying to replicate that. Because if I get 27 turnovers in the game, I feel pretty all right about what I'm doing. They forced that many turnovers. You're not going to lose many games forcing that many turnovers. But they just allowed Texas Southern to be too effective coming off of the turnovers that Grambling gave up. It's not even like Grambling gave up a lot of them. They only gave up 16, but they were running the court every time and they couldn't stop them. That comes back to the key. Stop the ball. Stop the flow of the game. And I don't just mean stop the ball in the sense of taking the foul. No, stop ball. 
Stop the the fast breaks. Getting in, get it into a half court methodical game. I think that kind of favors them because when you look at it, they had a lot of turnovers for Texas Southern. You're not going to be able to get a, get away with that many turnovers. You're just not. And then Alexis Holt on the offensive side of the ball, she's good for 16 a game. That's exactly what she gave TSU. And that's what her average is, but she had a couple of slump games that brings it down. If I'm telling you that somebody averages 16 and they're getting it brought down by a couple of slump games, that should just tell you how good they score on a regular basis. She, she's been scoring since the non-conference schedule was going on. And overall, she's getting 20 points, 20 points, 20 points. That's before she gets in the swag play. And I just feel like if TSU can't slow her down, they're going to have a long way to go. I think the key is to stop the ball from Gram for Grambling. But Alexis Hope, who is the SWAC player of the week reigning, right, having 27 and 28 points in a game, her last two games, if she continues that hot streak, I don't think Texas Southern is going to be able to weather that storm. I just don't. You have to stop her too. Um, we're talking about both of these teams on different sides. We're talking about Grambling's defense, but a big key is their offense and Texas Southern's offense, but a big key is stopping that, that monster that is Alexis Hope. Because she is good for a good 20 points at any given game. You just don't want that game to be on NBA TV on Saturday. That's what I'm looking for. And going forward, we're going to be talking about Alabama A&M's new defensive coordinator. And why I think this was a move that they saw coming well before it actually happened. We'll be right back with Locked on HBCU. All right, as we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked On HBCU, Alabama A&M has a new defensive coordinator in a move that not only was necessary, but I think they foresaw coming a year in advance. And I think it was the right move. I think it was definitely the right move, okay? Because when I look at it, you have a kill glass. Well, let me rewind. Let me introduce the new defensive coordinator, right? It's, Ken it's Kenis Bowler, And he was the defensive line coach last year. He's a new defensive coordinator. And I think that this was, I think they knew this was coming. I'm going to tell you why, but first I'm going to tell you why it's necessary and why it needed to happen. And it needed to happen because Akil Glass was a great quarterback for them, right? But too often, they were in shootout after shootout after shootout. And look at the best teams. Look at the two best teams in the swag. Jackson State and FAMU. They both have crippling defenses. They, they, they just did. FAMU had Antoine Collins. Uh, they had Marquise Bell. They were a great team on there. Um, so when I look at it, I say you have – oh, Jackson State. I, I'm not even going to talk about Jackson State because we just talked about James Houston a couple of days ago. And overall, I think that you look at the best teams in the SWAC, they have good defenses. Alabama and m obviously wants to be one of the best teams in the SWAC, but they have no defense. They, they are the exact opposite. And they have a kill glass, the most important uh, position on, on the team quarterback they have a great one a legendary one right but i'm a saints fan i've watched them go through years of prime breeze with a terrible defense it is not a recipe for success i think sometimes when you have a quarterback the caliber of glass and some weapons like he had because he did have weapons out there they can cover up a lot of stuff and a lot of times when we talk about a quarterback covering up something it's because or they're talking about lack of weapons, right? Or maybe they're talking about bad play calling. Maybe they're talking about a bad offensive line. They're talking about things that are in the offensive, you know, just scope, in the offensive huddle. But sometimes the quarterback covering up things is that they score so many points, the defense is not discussed as much. But at the end of the day, you put makeup on a star nose mole, it's still a star nose mole. Look up a star nose mole. All right. Look it up right now. Okay, so you understand how ugly a star nose mole is. I, I hope you did, because if you just looked at me, just look at the camera, or you just listen to me being silent, you probably think it's weird, but that was supposed to be a moment of silence for you to look that up. Anyhow, when I look at it, that defense has cost them games. I look at their path towards success, and I look at Akil Glass, especially in that spring 20 uh, season. I look at it, I say, man, yeah, he was a swag player of the year. Yeah, he was a player who was well-respected, and he two-time SWAC player of the year. We get it. And you did win it all. You were the SWAC champion. But even in that game, you, you just weren't consistent. In the years before and after, your team wasn't good. And that defensive coordinator, or your team was middling. I don't want to say wasn't good, but they were a middle-of-the-pack team. 
And that same defensive coordinator was here for all three of those seasons. But see, when you win a SWAC championship, some things get covered up. But no, the fact of the matter is their average was in the 20s as opposed to in the 30s, so it looked better. And yes, you won. So if you want to point to that, boom, play better defense. But even in that game, you had, I mean, that season you had shootouts versus Jackson State. You just had seven points that you gave up to South Carolina State. It made your average look a lot better. But overall, you never, you gave a bunch, a bunch of points to UAPB in a SWAC championship game. You just won. The path to success was shootouts. But here's the thing. You cannot depend on that every time. And now glass is gone. So that makeup that you had, it's gone. It's no more. And overall, in my belief, I think that even if he was here, this move would have happened. Because Bowler was added to the, to the staff last year as a defensive line coach. But him and Coach Maynard, uh, head coach for Alabama a and they have history. They work together. And this feels like a situation where I'm going to give this, this guy one more year. But if he don't work, I already know who I want to be my, my replacement. And that was Bowyer. That's what it was. They have history. They worked at Winston-Salem State together. And that team went to the D2 National Championship. So if you're Alabama a and I'm going to give you a little bit of optimism. Dwayne Taylor is your offensive coordinator. He is a great play caller. I think that he will help whoever the offense or whoever the player is in the offense move at a good pace. Now you have Maynard paired with Bowyer. And the last time that they were together, they were, they were near the national championship for everything. That's reason for optimism because you have a pairing that has shown that they can effectively win or effectively build a good defense. And, and Bowyer has head coaching um, experience as well. So I think that's always great when bringing that into your coordinator or position group or anything. Just bringing it on to your staff, head coaching position or experience is great. They have history of winning. Dwayne Taylor, in my opinion, is a winning play caller. You're going to be in good hands. You just have to make sure you have the requisite talent to make sure all of the good leadership doesn't go to waste. But thank you for making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day. Every day on tomorrow's episode, we will be having Feature Friday. So make sure that you are checking that out because you're not going to want to miss it for your second listen of the day. Make sure you're looking to looking into Locked On Bets, your boy Q and Lee Sterling, giving you expert analysis and breakdowns to put some more money into your pocket. It's a big, uh, free game for big games. It's really that simple. Make sure you're checking it out. It's free and available on all platforms. And so the next time that we hear each other, family, y'all know where to find me on that blue app, that bird. Yes, Twitter. I dropped it right there at South Exclusives. Take care. Stay blessed. Peace.